we sound designed for track ID, so we got 18, but, uh, but the most recent is probably our all-in-one, like, mixing, like, preset bank for, like, FL Studio. Yeah. What's up, y'all? I'm Polo Boy Sorry. Um, I recently just dropped, I think, my vocal mixing kit for FL Studio and for Beats, basically just presets for FL. And, uh, yeah. What's it called? Uh, just vocal mixing secrets and uh, Polo's mixing secrets. <laughs> hey guys, um, I'm Trill. I go by Trill Girl Wings. And I just dropped, well, I dropped a kit a couple of months ago. It's called the Limitless Kit. It's um, It has melodies and midis. So if you guys need melodies and midis, check out that kit. All right, first official question, I'm just gonna jump right in. When did you know that your fans were ready for you to release the sound kit? Um, with my fans, well, first, uh, um, I, I uploaded a beat, and they wanted to know which kicks or which like snares I use. So I thought it was a good idea to drop a kick then. Uh, for me, it was like basically the same thing. Like I check my YouTube comments, and people would say like, "Where'd you get that tom, that drum, whatever?" Da, da, da. And then I figured like everybody was trying to make the same type of beat, so I'll be the first one to just put all the the, the sounds in one kit, and just figured they were ready for it. Um, for me, it was more uh, everybody was asking about our mix and like how we do our head weights and stuff like that, so. Uh, we just said fuck it and dropped the mixing preset bank with like 808, like how to like 808, like preset banks and all types of stuff like that for melody. So what practical advice would you give a producer who's trying to get to the point where people are asking about their drums? What kind of steps could they take to generate that amount of interest in their either mixes, their sound choices, their sound designs to the point where they're able to actually monetize that? I think just work on your craft, you know? Yeah. Just expand as a producer. And you know. have good quality sound. Yeah, just yeah. isolation, all that stuff. Another very direct question. How do you determine the prices of your kids? I know that's a concern with a lot of producers. Um, I go based off the content that's inside. Like if I know I put some exclusive sounds in there, it's gonna be a little bit more pricey if I put like, a lot of loops or a lot of midis that I know are gonna be like some fire to some people might be a little bit more. But for the most part, like drum kits are usually cheaper than anything else. And then the midis and then last is like the presets. Just go off the value of it, I think. Well, for me, I, I basically just look at the market and like, you know, put like an average price like to where I know it's gonna sell, but it's not too much. So try to give a producer who ever find the kit, like, you know, a good deal. Um, really, the average kit should be like around forty to fifty dollars. Is this kind of like the whole beat market where there's so much price variation that it's a? Because I because I've seen kits. You're right. I've seen the fifty dollar kits. I've seen the ten dollar kits. I've sold you know twenty dollar kits. Do you find that any one price point works better than another, or do you? Is there is that contentious is, is in the producer community? I know like the twenty five dollar kits; those usually sell out. Like, not sell out, but they sell faster, just because it's like a middle price. And then the, the higher price ones, depending on what it is, like if it's a preset kit, those will work. But if it's more like a, if I try to sell like a, a drum kit for fifty dollars, it's not gonna sell. But I just I just try different stuff just to see what's going to happen. Really? Yeah, you really just have to try different things up. Yeah, I don't know. For me, I, I just like, you know, put like a good price to where I'm not lowballing myself and at the same time, I'm like giving whoever's buying the kit like a deal. Mm -hmm. I try not to overcharge, you know. I, I know a lot of producers have some apprehensions about giving away their sounds, especially if it's their signature sounds. And some of you, do, especially Chris, you do sound design and, and um, Paula, you were talking about specific signature toms and snares and that kind of thing <coughs> on a psychological level mm -hmm. how do you get over the 
the fears of people just taking your style and running with it. Man, it took it took a minute, low key for me. Like then it's just like you know what, it's gonna happen regardless. And if if I don't do it, then I'm gonna miss out. So I would rather just be the person to be like, here you go. You know what I mean, because otherwise somebody else is gonna benefit from it, run off with it. You know. I mean, personally for me, I really don't care. You know, um, my, our style is like real versatile. And uh, I mean, we're constantly like getting better and like changing it up and doing different stuff. So it doesn't really bother me. Yeah, and really like everybody has an influence from somewhere. So everybody has their different influences. So. so it seems like a lot of producers are now putting out kids to the point where I don't want to say it's, it's at a level of saturation, but you know the competition is there. It's, it's a lot like just the, the beat selling marketplace. So in the age of increasing internet beat sales, how do you make your products stand out? Um, I would say like a catchy cover art and a catchy name. Yeah, or I mean, kind of just doing like, you know, beat videos like with your kids, so promoting it basically. So I mean, you create more awareness and maybe they can sell your, you know, your kit. Cause a lot of people in person with me, I don't like to buy kits if I don't know what's in it or like, you know, I ain't heard it or I ain't seen the quality from it. So, I mean, I, w I wouldn't go out and buy something that I ain't seen somebody use. Yeah. I just uh choose to like brand my stuff a little bit different. Like I kind of like recently, I just ran like a commercial base type ad where it just showed like a bunch of different random kits with different prices and stuff like that. And that like, I feel like it's just all the perception of it, you know what I mean? Just make it look nice, make sure that the sounds give an example of what is in, what's in there, and then hopefully they like it. Uh, Charlie, let me go back to what you said about coming up with catching in. What are some names of the, of the kids that you've dropped? <laughs> um, the, the most recent one I dropped is called Limitless because it has a bunch of melodies and midis, and like the limit, like the options are, you know, it's limitless. You can do anything with the melodies. In the midis. And I have a drum kit and it's a mixture of a drum kit and um, a melody kit. It's called the Crash Kit. And I just, like it has a crash dummy on the, on the cover. So it's just. So like I should have just made a, a kit for the DJ Pain one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put, that's a, put a painkiller on there. Yeah. Pain Back to the, <laughs> yeah, yeah pain, we haven't wanna talk about that. <laughs> You just uh, you just picked off some some psychological scabs. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> um, what is one marketing strategy that you use to sell your kids? Like I said, uh, just like you know, videos, just uh, using your kid, promoting it, so people can see like how it sounds and stuff. Yeah, mainly just giving examples of what's in the kit. Um, sending out emails, letting everybody know the new kids up uh, uploaded. Send them like a little snippet MP3, like what they'll get out of it, what they'll be able to make with it, what they're capable of doing with it. Yeah, basically just showing a demo, like a snippet on SoundCloud or something, or YouTube. Okay, so here's, here's let, me, let me go back to what everybody said. So everybody, um, Chris talked about videos, the truck kind of echoed that sentiment, and, and Polo talked about using the email list. All of those are platforms that are subscriber based. So let's, let's zoom out a little bit and talk about some strategies for increasing your audience in those platforms to target customers that are interested in buying kits. What, what are some suggestions? What are some strategies you use, for example, to grow your mailing list of producers or grow your subscriber list on YouTube of producers interested in buying these kits? Um, sometimes I'll do beat reviews and like feedback. So I have producers, like one day, like when I don't got nothing going on, I have producers sending their beats and I just tell them like what they can do to fix it, give them feedback on it, respond to it. And then what I do is they'll send the email to like another email. I capture all the emails, then I have I create the email list like that. And then send it out. Cause I figure if they're interested enough in for me to review their beat, they'll be interested enough in my content. And if I put up a new kit to help them and you know what I mean? Just help them build it like that. I think by like doing like, you know, tutorials and stuff, like something like that will attract producers, you know, cause Everybody goes to YouTube to look up tutorials, so you know why not do that? You'll start getting more subscribers that have producer base. 
you know, tutorials and demos and emails, all those things. What was the last thing you said? Oh, emails. Uh, demos, emails. What what specific tools do you use for the email? I mean, I know there are so many options. Um, Feedstars interfaces with Mailchimp, among other email. But what's my email platform? Aweber. So, okay. You said Aweber. Do you use any of those? Mailchimp. Mailchimp. I tried to get into Mailchimp, but like I don't know. I just never really got into it. So you just do it all by hand? Yeah. Like I like I got like my own little mailing list that I make on my own. Like I put it on my Google uh, Sheets thing. Just make it like that. Keep track of everything. All right, we have an addition to the panel. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, right? sorry guys, it's uh, Cash Money. <laughs> sorry I messed up with the time. <laughs> so Cash Money AP, everyone listed uh, the name one of their recent trunk kids. What's, what's the name of one of your recent trauma sample kits that you released recently? Um, that was a free one that I dropped in April for like my subscribers. Yeah, that was like uh, to thanks them to be like uh, super good to me. And they really appreciate it. How did you decide to drop a free kit? I mean, what was the strategy behind that? Um, it's like it brings like traffic to my page because you know they like free producers like free things. So if it's a free drum kit with like original samples, original drums, they're gonna like it, and it's gonna bring like more traffic to your page. So so that means that more traffic means like more people. More people means like, more like a... Uh, Higher chance of getting the sale. Exactly. Are you, are you keeping track? So everyone who visits your site, do you have some kind of mailing list set up for them to opt in and get updates? And I guess, how do you, how do you determine who is a customer and how do you send these, these free kits to them? Um, I do everything through my, uh, my YouTube channel, everything. I don't have like a mailing subscription. Everything is done, is do. I mean, everything is done like through my YouTube channel. Yeah, you got about a quarter of a million subscribers on YouTube now, right? So yeah. Okay, so clearly that strategy works. Exactly. Sorry, I'm like kind of like I was running, so. Oh, good. I'm, I'm just asking you all the questions, and you're like, oh yeah, shit. <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll start with Terrell, who didn't just run a marathon. Share one mistake you made. When you first started selling kids? Um, probably giving it away, giving it away for free to like a few people that I trusted, but they like kind of leaked it, increased my sales. So, okay. um, I messed up. I I was like slow. I put like a whole FLP mix and mastered already. My Nexus presets, my drum kits, mixing presets. I gave them like everything for like 25 bucks. Oh. And that was like right before like I started getting my placements and stuff. And I did it like like on the low key tip and then I, it was messed up, bro. <laughs> like it was messed up. Uh, I, I can't really think of like a mistake or anything I've done like when it comes to releasing a drum kit or anything. Um. I think I probably sold too much songs for a low price. Yeah, like 20 bucks for like too much songs. I could have done like three different drum kits and s sell them like the same price instead of selling a big drum kit for 20 bucks. So that was a mistake. So how have you adjusted your prices now that you have learned from that mistake? Um, I like to do like uh, different drum kits when it comes to my inspiration. Like I would do like a April drum kit. And it's gonna be like, I would say 10 claps, 10 snare, snares, 10 kicks. Then the next one gonna be like, probably like five kicks, five claps, it depends on my like inspirations. Yeah. So I had, I had a conversation with Chris earlier about kind of how frustrating it was to not necessarily trust the, the creators of the kids to deliver something original. I know I've, I've gotten kids that they were charging $9.99 for I see you smiling because I know, I know you feel me and I know a lot of other producers probably do. I opened the kit up and it was basically just every free Boy Wonder kit narrowed down to maybe 40 sounds and maybe compressed. I think, how do you, you know, 
granted, they're probably not gonna sue you for this, but as a creator of sound kits, obviously that would damage your brand. So when you create a kit, you don't have to give me the secrets as to how you actually sound, sound design, but how do you approach the creation of these kits so that it's original and it's something that uh, your customer base actually wants? Personally, me, I stay away from drum kits. You know, if I do any kind of like drum kit, I'll do like a perk kit, sound like vocal, like boxes and stuff like that. But other than that, I stay away from drums. I usually just do like preset things. That's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> 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 a toxic question. Yeah, it's kind of a toxic place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so basically, just not putting recycled sounds in there. Okay, that's a good answer. Hold on, let me see. So don't do that. <laughs> yeah, like, don't do it. Um, I guess it's hard not to give away, because that's the other thing we're talking about, and I think we, we kind of talk about what we did specifically to create the kids. And we're kind of both on the same page, but I don't necessarily want to put that information out there. So if that's what it is, then. I can give you some. I'm like, when I try to make a drum kit, I think about like what the customer like. Like, if I will personally use what I'm making, because I don't want to be like make a drum kit and the and think about like the customer gonna be like, oh shit, this is what. So I'm trying to be like, yeah, I'm put me in like the customer shoes and be like, yeah, I think they're gonna like that one because I'm pretty sure I'm gonna use it also. That's what. That's probably a pretty good litmus test because I think some people just jump on the wave of some of the kids and they want to put something out so quickly to, to make that money and they, they don't have the customers in mind. All right, that question is dead. Kill it. <laughs> selling beats and selling drum kits are fundamentally different because you're appealing to two different demographics. One is rappers, one is producers. I personally struggle with this. How do you attract both demographics? Because you're all selling a lot of beats, but at the same time, the people buying beats probably don't want to buy drum kits. I mean, I think, like, consistently, like, dropping, like, beats online and, like, you know, becoming, like, a top seller and, like, you know, starting to, like, introduce your brand to everybody and getting everybody used to your brand will attract both producer and you know, artists. So, yeah. much. And like, um, like, like you say, like, uploading a lot of beats consistently. Like, other producers may hear your beats, and they might like like your sounds, and that would be like a good time for you to drop a kit or a drum kit, melody kit, you know. Yeah, you just build up your brand, build up your name, put it on YouTube. Get like, if your beats are rocking with the artists. Like a lot of producers are online looking at other producers' beats too, just for inspiration, just to see what's out there, you know. And like the majority of the people that follow me are like other producers. So like I know like that's one market, but I also know I'm making beats for the artists. That's the other market. Yeah, that's exactly what they say. Um, all is gonna come your way if you're the more popping. If you're popping like everywhere, they're gonna come your way. Even if the, the beats are like trash or like good, or the, if you got a good name, they're gonna come your way. That's the same thing, like, I won't then say this, exactly the same thing about producers, but if you get, if you get like, you got like a good following online, and you make like dope beats with like original samples, like drums, they're gonna come your way to, to get your, your sound, because they try to not, I would say they try to not sound like everybody else. So if you make different things, they're gonna come your way for what you got. So one kind of plays into the other, as long as your brand is strong as a producer Everything with is rappers. Fine. Yeah, because I know for a fact, like, I didn't think Cash Money AP was a real person for the longest time. Because I'm, I'm a DJ, so I do a lot of mixtapes. And you too? Yeah, I didn't think he was real, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I used to see you all the time. Cash Money AP! I'm like, who's doing? Like, you know, I was asking that like 12 times yesterday. Dude, I woke my roommate up just screaming that out. Um, not because I'm a weirdo, but... <laughs> uh, I, I, I host mixtapes as a DJ, and it's just I can't do a mixtape without a Cash Money APP. So that's the kind of brand awareness that would push me as a producer to maybe check his, his kids out and make a purchase. What are some other really unique angles that you 
you've taken, just branding in general when you started, whether it's selling beats or selling kids, that you're really proud of? Yeah, what, what, are, what are some unique marketing strategies that you've used to brand yourself just as an overall producer brand uh, that you think you're proud of because they're so unique? I think for my tag, you know, it's my tag is different. I don't have the same typical tag everybody else has. Yeah, I feel like tags are super important. Yeah. Like that's what's going to stick with people in their head. That's how people are going to first know it's your work. That's just, you got to find something that's going to stick so that way people remember your name and know what to apply with you, remember? Yeah, and I, I feel like my tag is just like so hype the way it drops in, so we kind of like wound it that like on our beats. Like a lot of our beats are like more dark, more trap, but then we kind of like do the like the exact opposite, like some R&B shit, so, you know. What, what marketing channels do you feel like you have the most success rate when dropping your kit? Like Twitter, YouTube, announcing, announcing when you do have a kit? Uh, Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, Instagram and Twitter. I think Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Yeah, I think YouTube. <clears throat> because when you use YouTube, you can do like a, a ads video. You can also do like a contest. Like, be like, oh, I'm going to use this drum kit. Then I'm going to send you like free, free uh, instrument from it. If you make the best video of it, you get the free drum kit, like the whole kit. Or you can do a different uh, contest. Like, that's what I personally want to do. That's like, I send you the drum kit, we make we make like a free collab, and I give you a, a discount. I mean, that's like doing like a, a contest with like more than 50 producers. We make a contest, I send you the drum kit, and then one of the producers is going to win the, the contest, obviously. Then for the other producers, I'm going to give them a coupon, like 30% off on, on my website, so they can get like the drum kits. So if you attract like 50 producers, you give like a couple of 30% to 49 producers, you will get sales, of course. And you will win because that's gonna be like, put like traffic to your page. With the contest, then you're gonna get sales with a couple. So that's, that's, that's why I think YouTube is the best way to like promote a chunk. So, so listen, and you know, there's a lot going on just in the beat selling, or sorry, the kid selling world. And on top of that, I know what it, at least somewhat, the amount of effort and the amount of time, commitment that it requires to sell beats at the level that you're all selling. Are you doing this all by yourselves? Do you have a team of people that you trust that help take some of the workload off of you so you can have time to create? How, how do you balance all of these different tasks? I mean, there's two people in B-Demon, so, you know, it's, it's a little easier, like, on us to, like, put out a lot of work, but also, you know, outsourcing and, like, hitting up, like, different, like, drum kits selling websites, and it would take the marketing out of you if they have a strong brand, and then, you know, you might make more producer, like, fans just from doing that. Um, I, well, I do everything solo, so I have to stay on top of it. So it's kind of, it's not really a hard task, but it just takes a lot of time. But if you're dedicated to doing what you love, then you'll put the time in to do it. So. Yeah, you just gotta pace yourself. Like, you gotta figure out, make time for what you gotta do. Like, sometimes I gotta make time to make just beats. And sometimes I gotta make time just to mix them. Then days just to make the kicks and then put the kids out and brand. It's like, you gotta make time for everything. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Polo and Trail. So what, what, how do you pace your releases? How do you determine a release schedule for drum kits? It, it seems as though some producers release a drum kit maybe once a year. Some are releasing one every quarter. Some are releasing them even faster. It almost seems like they're releasing more kits than they are beats. How do you determine how you schedule your, your the kit releases? Um, it really just all depends. What I do, I probably like run a poll on Twitter and be like, should I drop a drum kit or a loop kit or you know a midi kit? And I just like let the like let the fans pick. Yeah, I just go based off like Snapchat, Instagram DMs, 
whenever people hit me up and say like, bro, when you dropping the next kid, like I know that they're ready for the next one. They got tired with the old one, so I like, usually just wait till then. Or, mm, yeah. <laughs> um, when I was sound designer for VST, um, normally I would submit two uh, two banks, and then I guess they would probably release like one bank once a month. So. Um, I think I'm trying, I try to like release the trunk in like every three months. I got trunk it's ready, but it's like, I'm kind of lazy, you know. I like to like, I have like, I, I like to like drop beats, make beats, but when it comes to like drop junkies, different things, like go on different website, I'm like lazy. So I take my time when it comes to drop junkies and it works. So that's the thing. The guy who releases 500 beats a month is calling himself so lazy. <laughs> 500 beats a day. <laughs> um, Chris, I'm, I'm really interested in your sound design endeavors. Can you explain what that is? You, you have a partnership with, with, you said, Track Guys? Yeah, I sound like, sound design about 18. Okay. I sound design like 18 preset banks for them. Each one has like 80 presets in them. I mean, they were... I've, I've seen them starting up before they were popular. So, I mean, I kind of got in while the door was like, you know, still open. Um, and I just went from there with them. So now they have a bunch of our preset banks and stuff like that. And I mean, I just hit up different like drum kit websites and also try to like outsource our stuff or they contact us, vice versa, you know, so pretty much. How does that process work though? Because Track Guys VSTs are their own technology, right? There is, you're not releasing a preset bank from um, Silent or a, a Nexus suspension bank. This is something specific to their brand, their, their company, right? Yeah. I mean, I can't say how I design the sounds, but I design them, they got them, they put them in their thing, you know? Pretty much. Can you break, you don't have to give me specific. I'm, I'm, targeting you for because we just talked a bunch this morning oh, yeah, yeah. um so apologies for that oh so, how, oh so how does it work out so i mean pretty much you know we agreed on like how we're going to split the bread um after that they tell us like what they need from us or what are they looking for and they kind of left it open for us you know they were just like you know make whatever you like you know but try to just have like a like an overall like specific like thing so like if a R and B bank or like a trap bank or you know like a hip hop bank or like some space shit like have an overall theme. So pretty much that's what we do. You got a question? Yeah, this is for the VST that they mentioned. Yeah. The one that uh trap what is it called? Trap guy. Yeah, I got that VST. That's yeah. why I'm just wondering like what Okay. So you made all the kids that uh I like made the bank and sold the kids. I made eighteen of the preset banks, but I don't think they released all of them because they have so many from us. Okay. So okay. they're they're probably still just releasing them. So when the when the VST first came out, I was, which ones did you make? Uh well there's one that says B Demons, then uh the EXO tri trilogy. Okay. Um but there's so many other names that's coming out of the memory. Trapzilla. Uh I, I got that one. Damn, I forgot all the names, bro. There's so many. You know, there's one called Cook Up or something like that. Yeah, I don't think I made the Cook Up one. Um, damn, I don't know. I made a lot of them. <laughs> okay. So a lot of you are, are selling kits directly. Um, to those of you who sell kits directly from your own platforms, why have you decided to do it that way? And to those of you who have had partnerships with distribution services, which ones have you worked with and why have you decided to partner with those companies? Um, I never tried to to have a partnership with like one of those websites like Spice, no, I never tried. Because we, my YouTube channel is working good, so I never think about like going to another platform to like distribute my web, my trunk kits. I mean, me personally, I just wanted to get my brand out. So uh, why not outsource it and like jumpstart, like, you know, my brand on the producer side. So then I don't have to spend as much money on marketing. So it saves me time and money. Um, I just feel like 
I should just keep all the money to myself and like not put it on another site and like share money with um, somebody else on their site when I can just do it on my own and keep all the money to myself. So yeah, I'm kind of with Trail because like it's a lot of people. Like sometimes you'll get in a situation and you might get finessed. You know what I mean? Like I know I ran into it once or twice, and I got you just got to learn from it. I figured why I let you go collect on half of what I made when I could just do the work myself and promote it myself and you know get the whole turnaround. Okay. And see, and that that's the downside of it, you know, because I have ran into a situation like that. I mean, the best thing to do is just, you know, walk away, chop up your losses, and it is what it is. Uh, but I mean, you know, that is the downside. But if you ever do do that, you know, you got to make sure all the paperwork is in line. You know, y'all have a, like a solid agreement. If you don't have paperwork, don't send them nothing. Okay. So, is it so you, you both had experiences with? Um, dealing with a company that you got taken to advantage of you? I mean, like, like it's just, it's a couple of situations, low key. It's just like, like for instance, like when you send in your kit and then you don't get a, a sheet of the reported sales. Yeah. You know, like, you don't know how many, how many times the kit sold on that site. And then it's not set up to automatically send your payment to you. Like, I like to keep track of who's buying my kits, you know, how much we made off that kit. And then if I can't get those stats, I don't know. You could throw any number at me, and I'm gonna believe you. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's the that's the downside of it. So I've dropped a few kids, and as we all know, a lot of these kids out here are, and it's been a headache for me, are being distributed illegally through file sharing services, through Reddit, <laughs> as what happened to you. How do you prevent kid piracy? I just ask them not to do it. <laughs> I mean, it's really no way. Like, it's kind of hard. It's just risky. You just have to take the risk. Yeah. It's just like YouTube type. You know, people kind of just go rip your feet off of YouTube. Speak to the mic, bro. Speak to the mic. I mean, it's just like YouTube. You know, they could kind of just like rip your stuff off of it and, you know, keep it. Um, you know, if you do find, I normally like go to uh, Google sometime and I search like B Demon, like Kid or whatever. And if I see something on Reddit, I'll just report it. But I mean, I don't constantly do that. I'll probably do it like once every two, three months. But I mean, it's, you really can't prevent it. Yeah, I think you can't. That's like, it will always happens. That's like, I'm pretty sure like one of you, or even us in the room already downloaded pirated like, kids. So yeah, it will always happen. So the only thing to do is like, to not think about it and like, Keep going. No. Here, here's a, a bit of advice. Um, what you can do instead of Googling yourself, because that takes time. Yeah. You can set up a Google alert. I think it's just google.com forward slash alerts. And I have one set up just for DJ Payne one. And I think I have another one set up for DJ Payne because people just don't have time to add the one to my name all the time. So every anytime something goes online that is related to me and my brand, I see it because Google spiders, you know, everything and indexes it. So I've caught lots of piracy. The problem is sometimes people will use these, these sites that, they're like piracy aggregators where you'll upload the kit and it'll distribute it among five different file sharing sites. And these bitch ass sites really want to play with you and, and waste your time, excuse my language, where you have to write this full legal statement pursuant to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of whatever the hell year it came out in. And it's like you gotta write a, a damn novel and you know change the different uh, words to, to match what your issue is. And then they'll say, well, we will review your claim within 24 hours and then we will take action with Seventy-two hours. Like, damn, bro, you know how many people can download my kit within a three, four-day period? A lot. So it's frustrating, but at least using the alert will streamline the process, and you don't have to um, deal with googling yourself once, once a month. You'll just get alerts every time your name comes up in a, in a new index. So that's helpful. Um, <laughs> here's a can one. This happened to me recently. I had a couple of my original sample kits get used and that one of your, um, one of the mistakes that, that some of you mentioned earlier was giving away stuff for free. 
but then you've also said that, that helps build your brand. So I've experienced both sides of that coin, giving away a lot of sounds for free. It definitely helped build my brand, but I guess I wasn't thinking in my head, well, what if one of these samples gets used for a successful record? And of course the crates were here, because it's actually a German rapper that they've worked with. It's a rapper that, um, that, that, that had a beat with my sample in it that I released for free. And it went, in fact, this dude's a multi-platinum rapper. Someone told me about the sample, and I looked at the music video, it had millions and millions of views. I'm thinking, damn, I could have made some money off that, but I didn't because I just gave the sample away for free, so really, what can I do at this point? Um, what happens in the case that your sounds get used in songs that generate a fair amount of money and publicity? Do you have something in place that allows you to take advantage of that success? Or have you been in the same situation as I have? Um, what do you mean by samples? You mean uh, drum kits or just loops? Loop, like a loop, loop kit, uh, instrument loop, a mini um, loop. I think when you got when you say a drum kit, you should like say like in the paper like a readme page. Uh, it's no royalty free. And if it really happens to you without them like eating you up about the split, you should definitely get get a lawyer. So you can take care of it. That's my. That's what I think you should do. But I never drop like loop key and midi key, so I can't. I don't really know. Yeah, I've like, never dropped a midi or loop key, so you know, like I said, I stay away from like jump kits and like loops and stuff like that. Just pre-sale things. Yeah, like I just started recently doing midis and loop kits, so I don't really got too much experience as far as that goes. When you, when you drop those kids off, do you consider them royalty free or? Oh, uh, no, I put a, a readme file in there telling them that if they do end up getting the placement off of it to contact me. I put my email, my, you know, Twitter, Instagram, phone number, whatever it is they need to get in contact with me. And then after that, hopefully get my lawyer involved and work out the splits and go from there. Yes, sir, we got a question from the audience. I'm on my bad. Trust, trust, trust. Oh, I was just going to say, um, yeah, just put like a readme in there to, so. If your sample does get used, like they should contact you, help them contact you, so you can get paperwork for the songs, or the song. Yeah, I definitely did that. I mean, just got two kids on the way, so I'm scared to death of that happening again. Man. Not getting that money. Yes, sir, my bad for cutting you off. Oh, no, it's no problem. So, um, I want to say, because I'm just asking a question, and I'm no far by any lawyer or anything, but from my understanding, from my research, that when people sample your music, ain't that called derivative rights? Like it's like a derivative of a, of a sample bite? Because uh, that's how, that's how like if it was a major, if it was a major record of a major company, that's what it's called, right? And they, they use that and that's how you run. That's how you get royalties where well, they work out the splits through them. Yeah, it is a derivative. I don't know if it's a, I don't know if derivative rights are a legal term or if it's just kind of something that they use descriptively. But when I've gotten major placements off beats that I've sampled, it's just a negotiation with the publishing house. Right, right. But I'm talking about the technical term of it is called derivative rights. Yeah. So if like a person buys a beat off Cash Money and records a song to it, that song is now the derivative of that beat. Right, I'm talking about when they sample, like, for instance, like, Payne one had a sample, right, that, that the record went, and since he's the original composer of that sound, then he should get some publishing from that. Well, he's gonna have to, yeah. If it's, you know if it's a derivative. Somebody did that to, uh, yeah. to um, I can't even think of his name. Uh, it was a major record this year. Somebody had sampled it. Uh, I can't even think of, I can't think of right now. But uh, somebody had sampled it, and the composer of that, the person who composed that sound actually gets publishing on that song. Mm -hmm. You don't know oh, yeah, no, you definitely, the, the, the issue is if you don't necessarily define or if you consider your work royalty free, you may not, you, well, if you consider it royalty free, you, you shouldn't be entitled to receiving those rights. What I'm just going to do in the readme, honestly, is just set a percentage and include my publishing info in there because, you know, if, if, if I, I just don't want to deal with people that often, you know, like, I, if, Somebody, if somebody uses it, I don't necessarily want to negotiate with them. Just give me, I think, 15% of the record. Just give me 15% of the record and keep moving. I'm happy with that percentage. 
if it becomes bad and bluesy, like what happened with, with that's what I'm about. Yeah, that's what I'm about. Yeah, but the, so the thing with G Coop is, did you see the interview? Yeah. So he creates vintage sounding loops right. and sample libraries, much like Frank Dukes, much like um, who are the other I people? I saw it on your YouTube channel. Yeah, QBs. Yeah, yeah, it was on my yeah, yeah. was plug. <laughs> if anyone has that exclusive producer interview content. Uh, in I follow you too, man. Yeah. I follow like everything you do, bro. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so what he did was he sent those those sounds directly to uh, Metro Boomin. You know that 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 record Two Chains Catch a Vibe. Yeah. I'm so mad because he sent me that same sample like three years ago. Oh, that's the same thing. Yeah. Because yeah. I was listening to him like I heard this before and I was like, oh yeah, it's because it's on my computer right now. Um, but shout out to him and. You know, when you send stuff directly to producers, which is another way of, that's what Frank Deuce does, and yeah, you make great money yeah. off that. Um, I guess I should ask, have any of you ever done that or considered doing that where you're working directly with, Cardiac does that? Yeah, you're Cardiac, yeah. Directly with a producer where you send them your ideas. It's not a collab per se, it's just you have the musical foundation, they do what they will, or they do split. Uh, Jake one. Yeah, Jake one does it. Yeah, normally, I, if I send somebody something, it's for a collab. Yeah. Not really. Yeah, I ain't did it yet. But I would I would though, depending on the producers. Like if I know like we can make some cold crazy stuff, like I am down. You know what I mean? But most of the time when I say my stuff out it's just for collabs. Collabs. Yeah. It probably depends on the split, right? Yeah, collabs. Money is money, baby. So all of all of you do collabs pretty regularly? Mm, yep. What tends to be the split in a collaborative scenario? Is it does it depend on how much work each person did, or you just I do all right, the way right down the middle? Yeah, yeah. with me. Don't, don't matter if you had a clap, a hi hat, you had something to do with it. <laughs> Get your fifty, bro. Like, that's how it goes. So you give them a fifty percent club percent if somebody has clap. No, like okay, like friends the same thing. You collabed on a beat, right? And I put the beat on B stars. Fifty percent of the sales gonna go to you. Fifty percent of me. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, you're talking about selling beats. I thought you were talking about like the actual record. I mean, record too. Yeah, it was a good place too. Yeah. It could, it could be a place. I'm just saying, you know, some people just like to keep it simple, cut it right down the middle. So, personally, I agree with that because I'm not even trying to just sit here and fight with you. You know, you're a producer, and I thought, right. technically, I had it at hi hat, and then I, I took out your kick and replaced it. So, I should probably be inside of the 60%. Fuck out of now. You made this stuff together. Oh God! Now, now look at the audience raising their hand and not using the V-Star Summit hashtag. Oh, um, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> I'm good, man. I just walked in. Oh, yeah. I, I, don't, I, I, don't let me yell at you. All right. Uh, my question is, like, I, I hear you guys talking about you do, do collabs all the time. Like, do you reach out to people to collab with, or you just hear some hot and I want to work with them, and, and people get in touch with you guys? Well, sure. well, normally for me, um, if it's like an online producer and he got some names, most of the time they, they've hit us up, but in the beginning I have paid to collab with, um, I, I collab with the, the beat plug. Then after right. the first one, like, uh, you know, he hit me up for another collab. Did you say you paid to collab? Yeah, like that's so when you I- can actually pay to collab? Yeah, yeah. Really? I mean, people, yeah. people pay me to collab too. <laughs> 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 Yeah, now, well, this was like in the beginning stages of like when I first started making a name online. Right. So I looked at it more as like a marketing technique since, you know, the B plug has a bunch of like subscribers on YouTube. But I mean, at, with that, doing that, I built a relationship and now, you know, right. I can hit them up and get a collab and I don't have to pay. So, you know, it's vice versa. If somebody buys one from me, if it's good, you know what I'm saying? I'll hit them up and I'll do them. Oh, we had another question back there, gentlemen, the dark red. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, as far as collaboration, it, it wasn't really a question to have him. Um, it really depends on like the degree of the producer that you're working with, because I work with a lot of producers, and if a producer has platinum records, they're probably not gonna give a new producer fifty percent of a record, no matter what you're doing. Like I have a client that placed the Rick Ross record, and after the sample was a, he got five, he got one point five percent of the record, and 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 he took it with another producer that was a little bit bigger, and 
that's just you know how it happens. So you can't always just think that it's gonna be like, oh, we're gonna split this down the middle. But sometimes you gotta think about it, it's the look. Because, I mean, would you rather have 1.5 of a record and be able to say for your discography that I did a record with 50 or I did a record with Rick Ross or T.I.? Or would you wanna say, oh, well, I'm entitled to 10, 15, 25%? Can I answer this so one? Yeah, go ahead, bro. Can I answer this one? That's a horrible situation. I don't give a fuck who you put on my credits. That 1.5, no publisher is going to talk to you. At all. There's no interest. There's no stake in that song for you. You're getting nothing out of that collaboration. Wow. No, I'm not saying not you, but I'm saying if, uh, the, the producer. Like, you should never in your life get in a situation where you're giving away your music for 1.5% of a record well, just so you can put on your It is a sample, though. It, 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 was it was just a sample? So, so, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, that, 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 I thought it was a collab. No, no, no. You already know, depending on the sample. Yeah, you don't know until the label negotiates. 80% of the record is done. Then the artist is going to take 10% of the sample. Right. Then the artist is going to take 20% probably, if not more. And then the producer might luckily be left with 5%. Luckily. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, um, moral of the story, stay away from sucks. samples. <laughs> Bro, I love sampling, but it, it'll get you. Just get a higher, get, you know what? If you do sample, get a way higher advance at very least. You, you can do that. You can negotiate. Yeah. Um, let me try to get to a couple of these questions that we're getting, um, that we have submitted on the, on the Twitter. So uh, this is something that we've talked about in, in previous sessions, but we haven't talked about it today. Laura also wants to know if any of you use Facebook retargeting pixels on your websites. Oh, yeah. Uh, I do that for like beats. You know? um, haven't really done it for like drum kits and stuff. Yeah, just beats. Uh, I just recently learned about it, to be honest. What is it? So, what Facebook pixel is so basically anybody that visits your website, it stores them in the pixel. And then it finds them on Facebook and then it just shows them ads. So if you go to my website, you know, when you go back on Facebook, I'm pretty sure it's gonna show you like, you know, like a video of like, you know, me promoting or something. Okay. So Facebook Pixel? Uh Facebook Pixel. Pixel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't use Facebook Pixel. Um, well, I don't really use Facebook, but I heard him talk about that before, so I know that it works. Yeah, I didn't know about it. I didn't even know to spell it, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have another question from ABF on the beat, whose um, avatar is a cartoon that looks exactly like you. Uh, can't miss the hair. What do you think sells more, loops or sound kits, drum kits, that kind of thing? Sound kits, drum kits. Yeah, I think like preset games. Oh yeah, presets. Matter of fact, I'm not gonna lie, presets are like usually like the go-to. Cause like those, like every producer has like their own little signature quality mix on it. You know what I mean? Like my mix sound different from AP, from his, from his. Like, you, like some people, like they just take a liking to certain sound, I guess. Yeah. So you're saying presets, you mean just from? Mixing sound. presets. So like like mixing presets. Uh, Amish, oh, yeah, whatever. Presets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, VST presets, all types mm -hmm. of different stuff. It seems like the, the price points for presets are traditionally lower, but do you think they're starting to catch up to the sound kits? I think they're probably starting to catch up. If not, they're going to be more just because that's more like exclusive stuff, especially when it comes to like mixing presets, you know, um, and then like atmosphere presets or whatever. They're more like high quality. so. I mean, it's not your standard, like, drum kit or something. All right, we're sort of running out of time, but we got a couple more questions coming in. Uh, some of these we already answered. Can you talk about the time you were willing to spend on a kit? How detailed are you in creating one? Do so y'all do it all out. inside the box? Do y'all mix it up with outside hardware? When we're making the kit? Yeah. Um, All inside the laptop. Like. I mean, I got like I got like a cord and a rolling at the house. Okay. So like sometimes like I'll uh, 
like Chronos? Yeah, uh, no, like the M3. Okay. But you just um, like I go in there and just look at their drums, stuff like that, different sounds, drag them in there, chop them up, that kind of stuff. And then for the most part, just go in the old songs. Sometimes find like different like put a play for like the Vox and the Chance and stuff like that. Like find old songs, go in there, chop them up, clean them up, that kind of thing. I mean, I don't play drum kids. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, the first time I bought a kid, though, or normally when I buy a kid, it's normally because I just like somebody's sound, or I know they have, like, dope drum kids. Um, I would say for the drum kids, well, I like, I used to use a citrus to, like, make 808s and stuff, but I don't do that anymore. But for, like, I just like mix all the sounds, or I like sometimes I like record sounds like a top, like dropping a, a bottle top on something, and I like use it as like a percussion or something. What, what is before other than the kids that, that you create and sell yourself? What are some of the kids that inspired you early on to create kids yourself? The Johnny Giuliano kids. Yeah. And vibe. Yeah, vibe. Yeah, like them superstar old Johnny Giuliano like. When they start dropping their kids, like that's where everybody, I feel like, like I know that's what I started using when I started making beats. Like everybody went to freedrumkids.net, download the kids for free, low key, like all that. Well, I started with all the bootleg Alex Luger kids, man. It only my kids. Fucking chat. The Lex Trap Cat Crash. <laughs> Some of us are older than Lex Luger. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you were sampling off records and. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was at a thank you, man. Hard, come on, man. Who got that 808 from and that ASR, bro? Yeah, he's old too. He's winning, so <laughs> let, let me let me live in my retirement community in peace, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm at the I don't know, like, do y'all go in and be like, whether it's like mini kids or drum kids, period? Do y'all go in and be like, all right? Some days I'll like just be like I'll sit down and I'll knock the whole kid out. But then sometimes like my main focus isn't really kids. It's just beats. So like sometimes I might just have an idea from a beat or I won't finish it and I'll be like, oh I'm never gonna finish this beat. Throw it in the midi kit folks. Like you know what I mean? Like um, for me basically, you know, I, while I'm making beats sometimes I'll kinda get sidetracked and just start sound designing and just, you know, making like sounds that fit with the beat that I'm making. But there's times where I kind of like going like set with a mindset that this is what I'm gonna make and I'm not gonna leave until I finish it type stuff. So, you know, that's pretty much. Yeah, I tried to spend like uh, one or two hours designing songs. But you know, when you spend like too much time doing something, you start to be like, you Getting know, used to it. yeah. <laughs> so you should like design for like an hour or two, then stop for a little bit, start making beats, then go back to it, you know, so you can like, Feel different? Yeah, that's right. Um, I say just uh, basically what Cass said, like a one or two, uh, even like a few hours on sound designing, like just stop making beats and just focus on making sounds. All right, we got people that look like they might be official, kind of giving that look. So we, we'll, we'll end it with one last question. How can everybody find your drum kids? What is the website to go to? Um, what's the YouTube page? How, how do they purchase? Uh, just visit bdemons.com backslash like sound kids. So you can visit uh, polarboystarter.com. Right now I got all my kids 50% off right now until the end of this month. So come shop. Um, go to my B Stars page. I got wings at bstars.com. I gotta pay for my domain. It's clearly down. So. I got you. Got you, man. Yeah, just go to my B Stars page, and I have three kits on there. I'm dropping another one soon, though. Like, what's it called? The new one? Yeah. Well, it's not out. I don't know what I'm going. I don't even know what I'm going to name it. I just name it the same day as I release it. Sure, so. got loose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can find my drum kits at uh, cashmoneyapbeats.com. That's my beat style page. Really good design, by the way. 
Uh, yeah, I got the 99% off, so you can check it out. Alright. <laughs> 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 Alright, thank you once again to all